All right, so I, I think I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, thanks for everybody that came today. So my name is TJ Van Toll, and I work for Telerik. If you haven't heard of us before, we're a software development company. Uh, we have a bunch of swag here. You can see my robots here, and we also have some other shirts and stress balls over there. So please make sure to come grab a shirt from me, grab some other stuff after this talk. I'm going to be talking mostly about the Telerik platform today. I like to think of the Telerik platform as basically just a series of tools to help you build mobile apps, uh, to build, help you build hybrid mobile apps. So I'm talking about apps that are installable and via the app stores, um, so not something that you can access through a URL. And App Builder itself is a series of tools, so this is um, a little metaphor that kind of helps illustrate it. This is something that actually it doesn't appear on our website anymore, but I actually think it's a pretty good illustration of what it does. I think the only cooler one is if we could get somehow get the rights to use something like this, but I don't think our legal team will exactly go for this. But what I like about this is like it kind of gives this nice metaphor because you'll notice the biggest planet there is App Builder front and center. And when you build when you build apps with the Telerik platform, basically you build apps with App Builder. App Builder being our development environment, and then you use these other tools that appear around in more of a supporting role. And they all have very um, uninteresting names that kind of explain what they do. So things like when you need analytics, you can add our analytics tool. When you need a back end, you can add our back end as a service, mobile testing, et cetera. But again, App Builder is kind of front and foremost, and it's where I recommend that people start. So App Builder is basically a development environment for Cordo Cordova apps. So how many people in here are familiar with what Cordova does? A couple people? OK, so for those of you that aren't, Cordova, um, well, I guess a better question. How many people here are familiar with what PhoneGap does? OK, a couple other people. So Cordova is basically a tool that lets you take your web code, so your HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, package it up into a native app package, so basically an iOS, um, Android, or Windows phone app, and deploy it to a device. So it does that. The other thing it does is it gives you access to use native device features. So not a whole lot of people realize this, but on iOS, Android, and Windows Phone, all three of these platforms have a bridge or a way that JavaScript code running in a web view can communicate with a native layer. So it can call Objective-C APIs, Java APIs, um, C-sharp APIs on the respective platforms. And Cordova basically gives you an abstraction so that you can go from that JavaScript code running in the app to the native world. So the advantages of writing hybrid apps are you used to have that access. That's one of the big big advantages is that. But at the same time, you're writing your app in web technology. So if you're the type of developer that knows the web, um, it's a key, it's a great way to get into native app development because you can reuse those same skills. Now I can't talk about hybrid development with, um, without bringing up kind of the flip side of this because hybrid has had a whole lot of bad press associated with it over the last handful of years. So this is probably the most notorious quote. This is from uh, Mr. Zuckerberg from Facebook. And so this quote got a whole lot of press that basically Facebook two years ago took their apps, which had a large web component. There was a lot of, uh, a lot of HTML web views being used in the Facebook app, and they basically ripped them out and switched to entirely native code. So this happened, I think it was December of 2012, and it was followed by several other companies as well. So LinkedIn did the same thing, and there were some lesser names as well. And there's certainly something behind uh, behind these, these big uh, abandonments of using web code to build your apps. And if you look at the write-up some of these companies put out, a lot of them put up some really good engineering write-ups of basically why they made this decision, there was really two primary complaints of hybrid. The first was performance, as most people know, that it just wasn't fast enough on certain platforms. The other one had to do with tooling, like not being able to track down problems. Um, not being able to solve things like memory leaks. Um, had just really had no ability to do that sort of thing. So I want to address each of these individually quickly before moving back onto App Builder and then show where App Builder kind of fits into this, fits into this puzzle. So when we talk about performance in general, this is something that has improved in the hybrid world as an order of magnitude over the last two years or so. So first of all, you have the uh, just normal devices, Moore's Law devices get better. So that's true over basically the device that you have in your pocket, the device that I have in my pocket is a lot more powerful. It has a lot more processing. It has a lot more memory capacity than it did two or three years ago. Now that's true for hybrid apps. It's also true for native apps as well. Native apps have gotten better as well. But hybrid has a kind of specific niche when it comes to performance in that its performance is not only tied to the device and just the hardware characteristics, but it's also tied to the browser it runs in. 
So what Cordova does when it runs an app is it basically says, okay, each of these platforms has a web view API. So there's some class in iOS, there's a, it's called UI web view. On Android, it's just called web view. It's a Java class. But there's some class that you can use to fire up a, a browser. So it's what happens when you're in the Facebook app and your friend says, here's a cool link and you click it. Well, Facebook's going to fire up a web view. So Cordova uses the same basic concept, except it takes it one step further and says, well, that web view will be your entire app. So the problem when it came to hybrid apps that's still somewhat plaguing hybrid development today is that these web views on these platforms have been subject to some fairly arbitrary performance penalties. And so I'll discuss the ones on iOS and Android specifically. So on iOS, the UI web view class that I just talked about, um, for whatever reason, iOS chose to exclude certain performance functionality from that class. So that includes its Nitro JavaScript engine. Uh, and so what this means is that if you run an app in the Safari app that's just on iOS, and you take that same code and run it in a UI web view, the one in the UI web view will run substantially slower. Now, how much slower, it kind of depends on your app and what you're doing, any, uh, any a number of other things. But there's a certain performance penalty there. Now, the good news, and what this headline here, is that iOS 8 introduced this new web view called WK Web View, which WK Web View stands for WebKit that brings the Nitro JavaScript engine to hybrid apps. It brings a number of other performance optimizations as well. And again, the, the specific numbers are hard to get because it depends on exactly what you're doing. Um, but apps certainly have a performance increase in terms of how fast they run, how much less memory they use, um, and so forth. Now, the only bad news from this is that WK WebView at the moment um, contains basically a show-stopping bug for Cordova. So it is not shipped in Cordova yet. There is a plugin that's used to work around the bug that may get integrated into native Cordova. The hope is it, it was hopefully, or the, the hope is that it would make it into iOS 8.1.1 because it has been patched at the WebKit level, but it still just hasn't been incorporated in an iOS release. But the point is that hybrid performance, at least at the browser and the hardware level, is getting a heck of a lot better and has increased substantially over the last few years. And this is just for iOS. And iOS usually isn't the performance bottleneck, at least in any of the, the hybrid development, any of the phone gap development I've done, iOS is al almost never the problem. Um, so the problem is usually Android. How many people here have worked with Android 2.3 in any way? So a couple people. Anybody enjoy that experience? No. I see a bunch of head, head shaking. So the Android, old Android is just horrible. The old Android browser, I should say, is, well, old Android in period, but the browser especially is bad. And the web view is even worse. And in my opinion, that crappy old Android web view may be the single biggest reason that hybrid apps are associated with running slow. Um, because everything just ran slow in the Android 2.3 browser, especially the web view. But things are gradually starting to change. So in the Android 4 series, the web view got a little bit better, but Android 4.4 was really the breakthrough, which was released last, I believe it was last November or October, in Android 4.4 KitKat, where they switched the implementation under the hood to use Chromium, which was enormous for hybrid development. Because first of all, it brought a lot more APIs. The WebView that was currently shipping up to 4.4 was kind of this bastardized web, uh, WebKit-based thing that you really didn't know what it was. Um, being able to know that it's Chromium under the hoods brings a lot more features, it brings a lot more speed, it brings debugging tools as well. You have the ability to use the same Chrome dev tools that you'd use to debug a website to debug your Android app, which is pretty slick. And then Android 5.0 took this a step further in that they decoupled the web view from the operating system itself. So I say that Chromium shipped in Android 4.4, but the problem was that it was a very specific number of Chromium. So Android 4.0, if you have a phone that runs that, you are running Chromium 28. So if you're in Facebook and on Android and you click a link on, face, on uh, Android 4.4, you'll open in a Chromium 28 rendering engine. On 4.4.3, they bumped it up to, 30, to Chromium 32. But the most recent version of Chromium is actually 30, or, yeah, it's 39 at this point. And so there's no way at the operating system level, like basically, Operating systems map to versions of Chromium directly, and there's no way that that can actually be updated up until Android 5.0. Now, this was mainly done for security reasons. If you look through some particularly interesting security holes in some old versions of Android, it's one of the bigger exploits, because web views are so widely used, people would find like, oh, 
on Android 4.2, there's like this WebKit vulnerability here, and people can't update it unless their OEMs decide to push out a new version of Android. So it leaves a lot of users vulnerable. So it was primarily done for security, but it actually becomes very beneficial to hybrid apps because it means that as soon as people get on Android 5.0, that means that their web view will be up to date. Basically, that you don't have to worry about whether someone's using Android 5 or 6 or 22. You should be able to know, or if this pans out as it, they say it should, that the user is using the most recent version of Android and that your app is running in a consistent environment. Now, the only downside of this, of course, is that Android doesn't have the adoption numbers that iOS does. So that time to get users up to that 5.0 status will probably take quite a while. It'll probably be measured in years and not months. So you can see that KitKat is now a year old, but still only has about a quarter of the global market. Now, um, it kind of depends, though, on what you're building. Uh, those are global numbers. The US numbers, it's more like half of people are now finally up to KitKat. So it kind of depends, and things are getting better. Uh, but the point of all of this is that the future of hybrid is looking brighter. So if you look at iOS with WK WebView, if you look at Android with auto updating web, updating web views, and even if you look to Windows Phone, the performance on the web view on that platform has increased substantially as well. So performance is getting a lot better for hybrid apps. And the other part of this is uh, kind of from a UI framework perspective. So when I first started building Cordova and PhoneGap apps a few years ago, I would use the same tools that I use to build my websites, basically this, the, same mobile, the same mobile toolkits. But there are some very specific considerations that go into building a hybrid app. The performance is paramount because of all these reasons. And so building things like fast scroll animations and fast transitions between your views are really hard problems to solve in JavaScript. And having libraries that do this for you ends up being a big deal for the performance of your app, like having these solutions baked into a toolkit. And so I have a few of these listed here. Kendi UI Mobile is actually Telerik's tool. It's now completely free and open source. It used to be a paid thing. So that's Telerik tool. Telerik's tool, and that's what App Builder actually defaults to using. Um, the only other one I'll mention, Ionic, is a, really nice, is a really nice framework that's built on top of Ionic. You can use that in App Builder as well. App Builder itself doesn't really care what framework you use. It's really just tooling around Cordova, so you can use any framework you'd like. But we do recommend that you use one of these toolkits to build your app just because of the performance optimizations that are baked into them. And I should also mention, I'll make sure this, like this, the slides for this, I'll tweet them out, send them out after this so everybody has them available. I have some other links in here as well. So those are hybrid frameworks. Um, and so basically, performance has got a lot better. So the other aspect of this has to do with tooling. And if you look at some of these engineering reports from basically the, the companies that had problems with hybrid, you, you'll see that tooling actually comes up more often than performance. So Facebook talked about they couldn't, it talks about how they couldn't really track down performance issues. They couldn't find, like, where is my app slow on these Android devices? Um, LinkedIn talks a lot about memory usage, that they couldn't track down leaks. So people would leave the LinkedIn app open, and they'd have no way of seeing where memory was going. The thing would just crash suddenly on people. Um, so tooling ends up being a big problem. And I can certainly sympathize, because I know that when I first started developing hybrid apps, um, there really wasn't much. I felt like I was developing an IE6 app back in 2001, and I would just do crappy alerts, or I wouldn't really know what I was doing. And this is really where App Builder fits into this puzzle. What App Builder tries to do is make building these hybrid apps, building these web-based apps, as simple as possible. So it tries to build on top of what Cordova already, all the, what Cordova already offers and just make things as easy as possible. Now, in terms of what App Builder actually is, it's a series of development environments, essentially. So there's a browser-based environment where you can code in the browser if that's what you'd like to do. There's an installable Windows application. There's an extension for Visual Studio if you're a Visual Studio user. There's a Sublime text package. And then there's also a command line interface. And so there's feature parity across all of these different platforms. And you can even share code between them. So you can kind of pick and choose where you want to work, depending on what's, what you're most comfortable with. I'm a fan of just using the command line. So that's what I'll be using to show a few demos throughout this. And I have it on my slides a few times. But know that anything I show you will also be available in these other environments. So if you are more comfortable working in Visual Studio or working in the browser, that's something you can still do.
So I want to go through a list of things that App Builder does to essentially make hybrid development easy and kind of show you how you can use App Builder to build a hybrid app. So the first feature of App Builder I want to talk about are our simulators. And you can see a picture of them here. And I will actually, there we go, switch over to my app here. Let me see if I can bring this up. So if I want to create an app with App Builder, well, I should say, first of all, the, the CLI for App Builder is, install, is uh, installed from NPM. So just you could run NPM install dash G App Builder to get the App Builder CLI. I already have it installed, so I can run App Builder to see a list of commands that are available to me. And it's kind of hard to read with this big text. On a larger screen, it's formatted quite nicely. I can create a project with App Builder create hybrid. Just call it hello. So this will scaffold out a project for me if I head into my hello directory here. Oops. I can see this project get scaffolded for me. So by default, this is going to build a Kendo UI mobile project for me. It's a Telerik thing, so we default to that. There's a dash dash template option. You can pass the create command, or it's a little more user friendly in Visual Studio or the browser that you can use to choose the type of framework you want to use. There's also a blank template if you just are more comfortable starting from scratch. You can use that and just bring in whatever library or toolkit that you want to use to build your app. So once with it, I'm within my app, I can bring up the simulator from the CLI. It's just App Builder Simulate. And this will fire up the simulator here so you can just get an idea of what this looks like. So there's not much to this app. Actually, some of it, I think some of it's off the bottom. So you can switch. I'll switch to a smaller iPhone. Yeah, there we go. That fits. So we scaffold out a little app for you. We keep it basic so you can just use it as a starting point. This is the Kendo UI um, tab strip template, which is what we default to. But really what the simulator is about is to provide tooling for Cordova. So for instance, um, Cordova fires a number of events. It tells you things like, oh, your app just went offline. It went online. The device is ready. The app went into the background, into the foreground. And those are all mocked within the simulator. So you don't have to fork your code in order to test it here. It'll also mock all the core, Cord core Cordova plugins, of which there are about 20 of them. So for instance, let's say you want to view the camera. Well, the simulator will just prompt you with a file picker to let you basically mock out that call. But it gets nicer when you talk about some of the more, some of the crazier Cordova calls. So let's say you have an app that has contacts and you need to mock, mock out your contacts. So we can supply a default set that you can use for testing, or you can load your own file. And we have docs on kind of how to format that up. You can do geolocation. Maybe you want to test your app as in your some, I don't know, across town or whatever the case may be. File storage. Network connectivity, I find I use a lot for testing the offline capabilities of my app. If I just want to see what's it like if my app goes offline, does it sync things up when I go back online? These are all things that the simulator can help you with. Now, probably my favorite feature of the simulator is that since this thing is built with the Chromium embedded framework, it's actually Chrome but more or less running here, you have the ability to use the Chrome dev tools to debug this app. So you kind of get the Cordova goodness, the ease of testing these Cordova calls to tie into these native access, but still get to use the Chrome Dev tools to test your app. So that's the first piece of the puzzle, these, um, these simulators that come with App Builder. And there's other little things you can do. You can like rotate your device and silly other little things too. So that's the first step. The second step, um, let's say you've got your app in your simulator, you've tested it out, you've got the basic things up and running. Kind of the next step is to move on to our companion apps. So these are apps that you actually install from you, whatever device store you use. So the iOS app store, Google Play, the Windows phone store. You can find app, the App Builder app if you just search for App Builder there and install it on your device. And the way this works is, let's say, if I head back here and see if I can show my device. <coughs> Hopefully this will work for me. So this AB icon is App Builder installed on my Android device here. And what I can do is I have this app and I can say, all right, App Builder, and I'll open App Builder here. App Builder Live Sync Android, and I have to pass the companion flag. And what that should do is send the app over to 
it got disconnected. Let's see if my device comes back or not. It came back huge. But we'll see if it works. Live sync it over. And what this will do is basically take my code that's running on my development machine. I'm USB connected, so that's how it's actually performing the transfer. And it just happened there. So kind of huge. Let's see if I can crank it down. I didn't like changing that. Um, but basically, it transferred across the USB line, throw it over to my device. Now, the advantage of doing this over the simulator is the simulator is just a simulator. So we try to do what we can to make it as realistic as possible. So we'll mock things like the user agent string, so your code will know it's an iOS Android device, and um, dimensions and such. But it's still just a simulator. And you can't really simulate being on the real deal. So the companion apps help test your app actually on the devices that you're going to deploy to. So I'm running it actually on, this is an Android 4.4.4. This is running in a Chromium 32 web view. All the Cordova calls are going to work because I'm actually on the device. So if I need to use the camera API, I'll use the camera API. It'll just work. So the simulators offer you a convenient way of providing that next step. It only takes a minute to get the, your app on your device. If you're using some of the other Teller clients, if you're using the, uh, the browser-based solution, for instance, you'll get a QR code, and you can use the QR code. There's a QR scanner built into the App Builder app here that you can use to scan that, and that'll also transfer the code over to the device. So it's all about trying to make it as easy as possible to test out your apps on real devices. So that brings me to the next step. So we've worked with the simulators. We've worked with the companion apps. The next is to go to an actual true build, so to actually be dealing with a native iOS app, a native Android app, native Windows Phone app. So the companion apps offer you a bit more, right? You're actually on the real deal. You get to see your apps. But there are certain things that you can't test on the companion app. For instance, you can't test your app's icon. You can't test your app's permissions. There are certain Cordova calls that don't work without a true build, like certain third-party custom Cordova plugins we can't bake those into the companion apps just because of the permissions models on the various operating systems. So you actually have to perform a true build. And by true build, I mean using Xcode to build an iOS app, um, the Android SDK to build an Android app, and so forth. So what App Builder offers for this is a build system that lives in the cloud. So if you've heard of PhoneGap Build before, the service that App Builder provides is actually quite similar. I have a GIF showing this just because um, I didn't want to take the chance of this running live on stage. I sped up this GIF a little bit to, um, to show you, just to give you an idea of how the flow works. Builds normally take about at somewhere between 10 and 30 seconds. I'd say 20 seconds are average. So what I'm running here is I'm running Android, or Android, App Builder Deploy iOS and App Builder Deploy Android. And what happens is when you run the deploy command, you send a request out to our server that lives in the cloud and say, hey, I want to build an iOS app here. So it'll go ahead and do the build. And then when it's done, you'll download it. And if you run deploy versus build, deploy will actually send it to your USB connected device and install it and install it for you automatically. And so I'm running it for um, iOS and Android in this GIF. We also support Windows Phone as well. Now, there is one caveat that I, I absolutely have to mention is that so this is fairly easy for Android because Android doesn't really, um, Android makes it quite easy to test their stuff on their system. This is a bit of a hassle to get to this point on iOS because basically if anybody here, how many people here have developed iOS apps or worked with it at all? So a couple people. So you'll know that in order to even test an iOS app on your device, like a true app, you need to join the $99 a year Apple Developer Club. You need to set up certificates. You need to register your devices with Apple. And you need to set up provisioning profiles. And in this case, App Builder needs to know about all that stuff in order to build your app. So this is a giant pain. But this is something that um, as much as we, like, it kind of pains me to talk about this. Because App Builder's whole purpose is to try to make this as easy as possible for you. But there's, there's absolutely nothing we can do on iOS because Apple doesn't offer any APIs to, do, to help you with this. Um, so really, all we can do is we think we have very good documentation that walks you through this in kind of an idiot-proof way. We walk you step by step of how to go out to Apple's site and do this and walk you through it. In terms of the CLI, so there's, there's, App, Builder, there's App Builder provision import and App Builder uh, certificate import commands that you can use to tell App Builder what it needs to know. And we have docs that walk you through how to do that. Um, but it's just one thing that I, I, I feel the absolute need to clarify to people, because a lot of people get tripped up by this, that 
there's just no way around getting that around that $99 a year fee, even for testing your apps, even if you have no desire to actually put an app out in the App Store. But again, we try to document it to make it as easy as it possibly can be, and no matter how you choose to build iOS apps, it's a step that you absolutely have to go through at some point. So the next feature of App Builder is the one that I find the most exciting, and we call it Live Sync. And the way I like to think of it is bringing the refresh button that you know from the browser and making it available to natively installed mobile apps. And so you can kind of see what I'm talking about here. Basically what LiveSync does is it makes it such that when you change your web code, and there's watchers built into the App Builder client, when you change your web code, that code automatically gets refreshed on your mobile devices. And so I can show it uh, here. Hopefully, so I need to scale this thing down. My emulator goes somewhere. Somehow it went over here. That's cool. So I have my my app here, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up a watcher. So I'll say Android App Builder Live Sync Android. Um, this is running in the companion app, so I have to pass the companion flag. And I'll also set this up as a watcher. So App Builder will now watch for any changes to this app. And then if I head over here, and text is a little small here, but what I'm going to do is that home text that was on the top of the page, it's sitting right here. So I'm going to say, do some nonsense here. The live sync will pick up on it. And what I should see here in a second is the home text getting updated. And there it goes there. Now what's cool about this, or what's really cool about this, is when you get multiple devices hooked up at once, as I have here. So you could be sitting with your Android, iOS, Windows phone device, hook up live sync to all of them, and just watch as you're doing your code. So this is how we test this sometimes. This is from Telerik's Palo Alto office, where we have 20 or 30 of these things hooked up. And so we try to account for all the edge cases, all the crazy Android devices that are out there. There's some weird devices out there. Um, and we can normally get this live sync working fairly well in here. There's a bit of a lag um, just because there's 30 of these things hooked up. But we try to make it work on any device that's out there and to make it as easy to use as possible. And I should also mention, so. Um, I was showing LiveSync from the companion app, but it really works across all of the options I showed before. So you can do that with natively installed apps. So if you have .ipa, .apk, .xap files installed, you can use LiveSync with that and push out your code changes on the fly. Uh, basically, the way it works is we inject a little bit of code in there to make this possible. So there's more, um, more or less a is production flag. So we offer you a way to turn that functionality off when you go to deploy out to the App Store and when you're ready to go. But LiveSync makes a whole bunch of things possible. For instance, I was playing with this the other day. You can still work with Cordova plugins. So I wanted to know what do Cordova dialogues look like on all three mobile platforms. And so I could just set up watchers for all three platforms and start tinkering and see what things look like. Um, I was doing this with the status bar plugin on iOS as well. And I think there's really two cool things about this example. The first is just how quickly you're able to iterate on this code, how quickly you're able to get feedback. It actually is a bit faster than working almost on a native iOS app, okay, because you still have to go through that build cycle on iOS, even though it's fairly fast. This is pretty cool. Uh, the other thing is that I think a lot of people, when they think of Cordova or PhoneGap, they tend to associate it with the camera or the accelerometer. Um, they don't really think that it's this arbitrary bridge to native code. So you can do things like change the status bar. Or if you have a hybrid app, you can access any native API. So if you can think about it, there's a way to get at it. The problem has historically been that in order to do it, you have to write a Cordova plugin to do it. And so there is this ecosystem at plugins.cordova.io. But at Telerik, we wanted to more or less enrich that environment. And we wanted to provide plugins that we thought were verified, that worked, and that were well documented. And so we created this marketplace at plugins.telerik.com where we have about 30 or 40 plugins out there. I think it was 35 when I looked at, looked at it earlier. Um, so this, part, this marketplace, had for each plugin, we now have detailed documentation on how it works. We have screenshots. We have version history. We list out the supported platforms. 
And each plugin is completely free and open source. So it's not an app builder marketplace. These aren't app builder plugins. These are just Cordova plugins. So you can use them with app builder. We'd love it if you use them with app builder. But if you're just writing a Cordova or PhoneGap project, you can use them as well. So I'd really encourage everybody to just head to plugins.telerec.com, look through the plugins, see if any of them <coughs> could help you with your app. And just to give you an idea of some of the things that are out there, there's a social sharing plugin, which is really hard to pronounce. But it basically allows you to tie into the native sharing ability that's available on your device. So if you're building a hybrid app, yes, you could bring in like a Twitter tweet button or a Facebook like button, but why not tie into the iOS, Android, or Windows Phone native capability to share via Twitter? There's an action sheet plugin. So regardless of what mobile platform you use, one of those UIs probably looks familiar to you. And there's a plugin that basically gives you direct access to this within your hybrid app. So instead of having to build this control out in JavaScript, you could just install this plugin, run a quick um, API call, and use this, use this um, UI in your app. The last one I'm going to mention is probably what I consider the most exciting one, is our new native page transitions plugin. And what excites the, uh, me about this is this is a common bottleneck in hybrid apps. So libraries like Kenda UI Mobile, like Ionic, they really try to help you build um, really performant transitions. And they do a lot with CSS3 to try to really optimize these things. But in big apps, sometimes this, this is a problem, um, especially on older devices. And so what the native page transitions plugin allows you to do is basically tie into the metal. Use transitions that iOS apps use, that Android apps use, natively installed ones, not hybrid ones. And I wanted to briefly mention the way this thing works, because I think it's actually kind of cool. So there's flip, uh, what is it, flip and slide methods that you can call. Um, but they're, so they're just JavaScript methods that you can call. But you can optionally pass them an href. And when you pass them an href, what happens is the plugin takes a screenshot of what you're currently looking at. It takes that href and it performs that navigation behind the scenes. So let's say you pass it pound view two. So it does that navigation behind the scenes. And then the transition you're actually seeing is from the screenshot to the newly navigated view. And there's a full algorithm within the plugin to try to make that as seamless as possible, to try to get the timing right so it doesn't look awkward. And I think it works fairly well in here. We're even exploring, we, uh, we have an adapter for Kenda UI Mobile so that it's just a quick JavaScript file you can drop into your Kenda UI Mobile app and it just uses the native page transitions automatically, no extra work from you. We're also writing one for Ionic that's in process right now. So we hope to have the ability that make these hybrid apps, like kind of give them the ability of native apps where you need them, but still give you the ability to write when, in web code where you want to. So there's a bunch of other plugins as well. Like I said, there's, there's almost 40 of them now. So if you want to make money off your app, we have AdMob now. We have PayPal and Stripe integrations if you want to accept payments. We have calendar integrations. Uh, we have background audio, all these other things. If you head to plugins.telerik.com, we also have a little link right on the top where you can submit your ideas to us. Basically, we, we have a user voice forum where you can vote on ideas um, for plugins you'd like to see. Um, and keep in mind, too, that Cordova is an open ecosystem. It's completely free. There's well-documented ways to create Cordova plugins. So you can create your own as well. Um, even if you're afraid to kind of head into the native world, it can be kind of fun to write a hybrid app in familiar web technologies, but just dip into the native world for just an API or two to get at what you need for your app. So that's pretty cool. The last thing I want to mention about App Builder is talk about all the little things. So those are really the big features App Builder has to try to make your app development, your hybrid app development easy. There's a bunch of little things too. Like if you want to some help managing icons um, and splash screens, because those are always a pain, and each OS has their different naming conventions. Our browser client provides a quick way of uploading icons. They'll size them for you automatically. So like that 57 by 57 iOS one, if you up, upload like a 200 by 200 icon, it'll figure out what to do with it intelligently. Um, splash screens as well. Just a small little thing. And the browser client will sync to all the other clients as well. So you could, even if you're using uh, Visual Studio or you're using um, the CLI, this will work for you as well. Just little things like checkboxes to configure permissions instead of having to deal with some strange Android manifest file. Same thing for plugins. We install all the core Cordova plugins by default. I think there's 17 or 18 of them. But we give you a quick way, some quick checkboxes that you can toggle them on or off depending on the needs for your app. This same screen also has a way that you can deal with the verified plugins I discussed earlier or import your own, um, your own Cordova plugins that either you've written or you found on plugins.cordova.io. 
And as I mentioned earlier, I think we have really good detailed documentation for all the things that we can't help you with. So there, we even talk about things like helping you deploy your app, helping you get into the App Store, Google Play, talk about how to use iTunes Connect, and things like that. So that's kind of where App Builder fits into this greater tooling picture when it comes to hybrid. But I'd really be remiss if I acted like App Builder was the only thing that's helped with hybrid tooling, because there's been a lot of other, t a lot of other companies, a lot of other uh, mobile device makers that have helped with this situation as well. So if you look at the PhoneGap team, they have a developer app, the PhoneGap developer app that works a whole lot like the App Builder companion app. It's a very similar concept. Basically lets you send your Cordova app out to the PhoneGap developer app and test your device there or test your app there. Ionic has done a lot of stuff. Ionic has a live reload feature that works very much like App Builder's Live Sync. So if you want to check that out. But probably the single biggest improvements have been made by the browser makers themselves. So I'm talking about Android and iOS and Safari and Chrome specifically. And so um, you can now, as of iOS 6, which I'm, this is very small, but I have iOS on the bottom, and I'm using Safari to debug that app. And on the top, I'm running Android 4.4 and using Chrome to debug that app. So this has only been possible as of fairly recently. Safari opened up, or I should say iOS opened up remote debugging as of iOS 6. So that was around the same time that Facebook abandoned hybrid. And Android, this happened as of Android 4.4. There was kind of some shady ways to, to use um, to use different dev tools to debug Android apps before 4.4, but 4.4 brought the full Chromium dev tools available to hybrid apps. And personally, I think this is probably the single busy, biggest tooling improvement that has occurred because it more or less directly addresses those concerns that the Facebooks and the LinkedIn's of the world had that I mentioned earlier. So for instance, if you want to try to track down performance issues in your app, you could open up the Chrome dev tools, you could get out your Android app, you could start doing some stuff. So I'm on the, I'm looking at the timeline view here, or that's the tab I've selected up here. And it has this functionality that you can use on your websites, but now also your mobile apps, where you check the frames per second that your app is getting over time. So you could just look for spikes. Spikes are generally problem areas. And this was an early prototype app, so it had lots of problems. And you can drill in to try to find those specific situations. Or at the very least, it helps you identify them, that this is actually a slow interaction and something that you should look into. So it's just tooling that helps you deal with that. The other one, you might remember I talked about LinkedIn and memory management earlier. And the Chrome Dev Tools offer some pretty decent, decent tooling around that as well. So this is the same timeline view. This time I'm looking at memory, which is the text you can't really see here. But basically this graph that ends up building is memory usage over time. You could even, there's a little trash can somewhere up here that you can use to explicitly request garbage collection runs. So you can see how your app deals with that. And when you really want to get in dirty, if you really want to dive deep into memory, you can even do things like get full heap snapshots and record heap allocations over time. So if you're really concerned with memory usage and you want to dive deep, there's tools in Chrome that help you do that. And so I don't have time to walk through all of this to really dive into the debugging tool specifically, so I thought I'd throw some links together for those specific features that I just mentioned if you want to look at them later. But overall, when we talk about hybrid tooling, so things that App Builder has done, things that Phone, uh, PhoneGap has done, things Ionic has done, and even things that the browser have done, have made hybrid debugging or hybrid app development a far, a far better option than it was just a few years ago. And I really encourage anyone who, maybe especially people that may have tried PhoneGap or may have tried Cordova App Builder a year or two ago, to give it another go, especially if you ran into problems because the situation is far nicer. It's far easier to develop apps than it was even just a short time ago. So the last thing I want to mention is kind of come back to this broader picture, at least when it comes to the Telerik platform and what Telerik offers. So I was talking mostly about App Builder that kind of sits in the center here, but the Telerik platform specifically tries to provide the tools that you need to build apps, and that comes down to more than just code. So a lot of these products have names that are pretty obvious in terms of what they do. So there's App Prototyper, which is a prototype tool, but it has drag and drop controls that you can use to, to basically build up your mobile app. My favorite feature of this is it has this um, ability to share and comment. So what you can do is, let's say you're developing an app, or you're st you have this app idea and you want to show it off to clients, you want to show it off to other people in your company, maybe you want to show it to the UX person in your company. You can share this, you get a URL, you can comment on it, go back and forth before you ever write a line of code. 
We have a backend as a service system. Um, so first and foremost, this is basically a backend. Well, it's a backend as a service. It's a which I like to think of as a database in the cloud. So you can do things like configure schemas for your application and get an API generated for you. So we generate a REST service for you based off the data that you configure. It'll also do things like file management. So if you just want an arbit arbitrary place for you to dump your fi dump files that your app needs, the backend service can handle that. It'll even go into more complex things. It'll do full user management. If you need a registration screen, you need a login screen in your app, you can use our service to do that. Um, we also have helpers for push notifications that I think work really well for Android, iOS, and Windows Phone. And that goes along with docs that help you add that functionality as well. The mobile testing service I like to think of personally is Selenium for mobile devices. So we'll help you automate your mobile devices, your Android, iOS, Windows Phone devices to run a suite of tests and report them back to you in our browser client. Analytics, analytics is very much like Google Analytics, but specifically tailored for mobile apps. So you can do things like see where in the world people are using your apps, what version of the app they're, you're using, how much they're using it, um, feature use, you can track which features people are using. Um, it'll even do exception tracking, so you can see how many times your app is crashing and maybe get an idea of why it's crashing. And the final tool is App Manager, which is more or less a deployment tool. So let's say you have a series of apps, maybe you don't even want to deploy your apps to the App Store. You could use App Manager to distribute them to internal people at your company. You could also use App Manager, let's say you, you, have, a, you have an app but you need to beta test it, you need to send it out to a bunch of people. You can use App Manager to distribute that, maybe gather some feedback, all before you end up sending it out to the App Store. But really the Teller platform was designed with modularity in mind, in that I talk about these tools, but you can use any of them, you could use all of them, you could use one of them, you could use parts of them. I already talked about how we default to using a Kendo UI mobile project, but you're free to use Ionic, you're free to use any toolkit you'd like to use to build your UI. Uh, we have a backend as a service where you can store your data and your files, but if you have some place that you want to store your stuff, um, that's great. You could still use backend services for push notifications, or you could just not use it at all and use something completely different. And that really applies across the board. Modularity was kind of at the heart of the Telerik platform. So if you want to give it a try, head to Telerik.com or Telerik.com slash platform. You'll be asked to create an account. And after you create an account, you'll be set into this flow here where you go through a series of tutorials that'll explain to you a little bit more of what App Builder is, what the platform is, and some of the things you can do. I do need to mention that the platform is a paid product. It, is, it has a 30-day free trial, so anybody can jump in and use it 30 days. Um, the lowest tier of the platform starts at $39 a month. If you want to use App Builder specifically, you can start at $19 a month and it also has a completely free 30-day trial. But I'd love it if people give it a shot, give me any feedback that you may have. Um, it's really low risk. As I said, it's built on open standards, or at least the hybrid apps you're building are based off open standards. You're writing web code, you're writing Cordova code. So even if you try out App Builder and you hate it, or you just don't think it's worth the money and you'd rather just deal without those tools and do it yourself, you, your code is still good. Your code will still run. You could switch over to just using vanilla Cordova, which is free and open source, and give it a go. So love if you tried it out. If you have any feedback, um, let me know. And really, I'd, even if you choose not to use App Builder, I'd love it if you gave hybrid development another shot. I think it's a lot better. Um, if you have any other questions about that, just come see me. I'll be around. My colleague Michael Crump is sitting over there. We'll be at, um, he's giving a talk next on Visual Studio and Android. And we have a bunch of swag. We have a bunch of these robots here. I think everybody here should have a robot. We have shirts as well. So I'd love it if you could come, so come grab one. Um, but that's all I have. So any questions, let me know. So thanks. <laughs>